everyone. So indeed, I am uh, Thibaut de Volder. Uh, I'm a research director at CNRS in the Centre de Nanosciences et de Nanotechnologie. This is on the Paris-Saclay campus uh, in the southern suburbs of Paris. And I, I'm going to talk about a subject that we started to work on a few years ago, which is to try to use spin wave for various applications. And the work I will be presented today is, of course, a collaboration between, uh, between several groups. So uh, there is uh, my group in, uh, in Orsay. Uh, okay, Umesh Baskar and Manu Sousrout, who are the two postdocs working on these subjects. Jovan Kim and Jean-Paul Adam, my two CNRS colleagues. And uh, the work is done in collaboration mainly with IMEC in Belgium, the group of uh, Christophe Adelman, okay, but also in the framework of an ANR, so French contract, together with the group of Mathieu Bayol in Strasbourg and the group of Michelaine uh, in Nancy. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will start by an introduction saying uh, what are the specific features of spin wave as waves, okay, and why, why they might be interesting. Uh, then I will spend a part uh, that is quite general about how to measure spin waves, uh, either electrically or optically. And then I will come to the core of my talk, which is going to be a spectroscopy experiment, how to measure the properties of propagating spin waves. Okay, and finally, I will show uh, an application of spin wave spectroscopy where we make interferometry of spin waves in order to make logic gates for wave computing. And I will show it for a majority gate configuration. Uh, so, so spin waves, uh, they are the collective excitations of a ferromagnetic body. Okay, so in a ferromagnetic body, the spins are parallel to each other. And if you excite the magnetization, Okay, it creates an excitation that propagates in space and time, which is the spin wave, the elementary excitation. Okay. And spin waves are interesting for, for integrated circuits uh, because they have uh, gigahertz frequency, so typically from 1 to 100 gigahertz, okay, uh, depending on the magnetic, magnetic materials and configurations. And uh, their wavelengths can be adjusted between the nanometer and the micron, and even the meters, but we're not so much interested in very long distances. Okay. And the dispersion relation, so frequency versus wave vector of spin waves, so this is one typical example. Uh, okay, at very large wave vectors, so very large means uh, 100 per micron, okay, so, so with wavelengths that are below 10 nanometers, then, and then the dispersion relation is quadratic with the k vector, this is when exchange comes into play, so for very short wavelength spin waves, the, tilt of neighbor, the spins of neighboring tilts are tilted with respect to each other, which costs a lot of energy, and this is this quadratic part of the dispersion relation. But in practice, uh, we will mostly be interested in the short wave vector limit, okay, starting from uniform precession at zero wave vector to, to a few per unit micron, which is called the magnetostatic regime. And in this, uh, in this uh, range of frequency then wave vectors, uh, the, we'll see that there's a lot of dispersion relations possible for, for magnets, but they're all going to be gigahertz and micron in terms of frequency and wavelengths. And uh, the, the one team of research in my group is to study uh, all electrical methods to generate, manipulate, and collect spin waves, and to try to see what we can do for, with them for devices. This is just an example of, of, uh, of animation of what, uh, what happens if you try to excite the magnetization. So this is a, an elongated ferromagnetic body, a few microns wide and 10 microns long. And what we do is we generate an homogeneous RF field in some part of the device. And what you can see is that indeed there are magnetization waves that propagate uh, and that uh, you have waves in different directions. And I hope at the end of the talk you will be able to predict this kind of micromagnetic patterns. Okay, so one specificity of magnetism is that uh, magnetism is a property of the material that is very anisotropic in general. That is to say, a magnetic anisotropy is the fact that if you have a ferromagnetic body, it's sometimes much more easy to align the magnetization in one direction than in, a, than in another. There's an easy axis and there's hard axis because of the crystalline structure first and because of the shape of the ferromagnetic body. So because magnetism is an isotropic, 
spin waves, which are the elementary excitations, will also have very anisotropic properties. Okay. And for instance, if we consider a thin film geometry, okay, so the magnetization can have three different orientations, X, Y, Z. Okay. And depending on whether the spin waves propagate perpendicular to the magnetization or parallel to the magnetization, and whether the magnetization is in the plane and out of the plane, the dispersion relations, even in a, in a small k-vector regime, will be, will be very different. For instance, there are the, what are called the Damonish bar uh, surface spin waves here that have a positive dispersion. There's going to be the backward volume waves here where the group velocity is negative, so opposite to the phase velocity. That's why they have the name backward volume. Okay, and then there, there are also the, the magnetostatic forward volume mode where you, if you put the magnetization perpendicular to the film, then the dispersion uh, is once again positive. Okay. So as you can see, there's many kinds of dispersion relations that are possible even for just, just one thin film. Okay. And so spin wave physics is trying to harness this diversity in order to, to achieve specific features. Okay. Uh, let, so spin waves are anisotropic. A second discerning features of spin waves is that they have non-reciprocity. Non uh, so, for instance, if you imagine that you have a thin film here and you're seeing the cross-section of this thin film with the magnetization pointing towards you, okay, if the spin wave is propagating to your right, okay, then it means you have the DC magnetization this way and the dynamic magnetization rotates in space this way uh, in, a, in a cycloid manner. Okay. And if you think about it, uh, here you're going to have positive, positive magnetic charges and here negative magnetic volume charges and in addition, because the magnetization is, is perpendicular to the film, you will have surface magnetic charges. Okay. And so dipole-dipole interactions give a, some pattern of magnetic charges inside the device and you see these plus-plus-plus charges, they don't like each other so the volume charge are repelled by the, by the surface charges and in fact, the situation that is favored is a localization of the wave, of this wave, near the top surface of the film. So the spin waves may have uh, uh, um, a, a profile uh, within the thickness, so that here a spin wave that was propagating to the right will, be, will tend to localize on the top surface, while if I was drawing the same graph of, but for a spin wave propagating to the other direction, it would localize to the, to the bottom surface. Okay. So here you immediately see that if you're trying to excite the spin wave from the top surface, okay, you're going to have non-reciprocal propagation because the spin wave is, uh, tends to propagate to the right if it's localized on the top surface. So this is what we call amplitude non-reciprocity. That is to say that the dispersion relation of the bottom wave and top wave are the same in terms of frequency, but they are not excited with the same efficiency. So amplitude non-reciprocity. So that's the first complication. But there's also a strong, sometimes, sometimes strong frequency non-reciprocity if you break the spatial inversion, which is always the case when you have a film that is sandwiched between a buffer layer and a cap layer that may be different. So you have spatial inversion symmetry. Uh, okay, so you've seen that because of dipole-dipole interactions, uh, the spin waves tend to localize near one of the interface. If you imagine now that the interface have different properties, so one interface has a strong, shows a strong anisotropy, while the other hasn't any anisotropy. Okay, then this means that the the wave that is localized at the bottom surface will see a strong interaction. Okay, so we'll have an f a frequency that will change compared to the one that is localized on the top surface, which means that now the dispersion relation of spin waves propagating to the right by the top surface and to the left by the bottom surface will be very different. Okay. And so this is a, this is a specificity of, of spin waves, very anisotropic character, and they can be very non-reciprocal. Okay, and here I showed the example of non-reciprocity. This is obtained through interface and isotropy, but there are other effects that I will not describe, but are, are due to chiral magnetic interactions that also provide a strong frequency non-reciprocity. Okay, so so much for the spin waves. 
okay, anisotropic and non-reciprocal. Okay. The way we measure spin waves uh, can be done either electrically or optically. Okay, so my favorite way is using what is called vector network analyzer uh, ferromagnetic resonance, which measures the uniform spin wave, so with k equals zero. Uh, and the idea here is simply to have, for instance, a coplanar waveguide, okay, so that have a given characteristic impedance and, and, and propagation constant. And on this coplanar waveguide, we just deposit a magnetic stuff on top with some finite permeability. So this will change the inductive contributions to the overall impedance of this ensemble. And so if we can frequency resolve the impedance of this ensemble, this tells us what is the permeability of the magnetic sample and how it varies with frequency. So this is, for instance, uh, what is obtained on a, on a thin layer of cobalt iron boron. Okay, so the transverse permeability at RF frequency is going to resonate at some given frequency. So in this case, 50 gigahertz. Uh, this essentially depends on the applied field, okay, and on the anisotropy energy of, of, of the magnetic film that we are looking at, okay. And it resonates over a given band uh, that is given by what is called the damping parameter alpha that characterizes the rate at which the energy that you put into the magnetic degrees of freedom leaks in the other degrees of freedom. Okay. But this is typically uh, going to be uh, uh, 1%, for instance. OK. Uh, so, so this is the usual way to, to, measure, uh, to measure uniform spin waves. And in fact, I've been using that a lot as a metrology tool to characterize the magnetic properties of complex stacks. So this is, for instance, uh, what is called a simple stack that is used uh, in standard spin transfer torque magnetic random access memories, where you see that you have several ferromagnetic layers, okay, uh, that each of them have a specific uh, functionality, okay, and in fact, if you just do the standard magnetometry, that is to say you measure the hysteresis loop of this ensemble, uh, in fact, it only tells you the ground state of the system. And in order to, to have the properties in a metrological manner of the different layers, okay, uh, we need to measure not only the ground state that is given by the hysteresis loop, but also all the excited state. And this is done by vector network for, for uh, vector network analyzer for magnetic resonance. Okay, as it's done here, so on every point of the hysteresis loop, so for a given magnetic field, Okay, we scan the frequency up, so this is, for instance, 0 to 70 gigahertz. Okay, and uh, so the color here is a measurement of the permeability, and you see that you cross different resonances. Here you have four different magnetic blocks, and so you cross four different resonances that corresponds to the uniform excitation of this layer, then to an acoustical excitation of this ensemble, then an optical excitation of this ensemble, and so on. And so this is a very powerful tool to measure the magnetic properties of films. And that's why spin waves have been used for a long time just as a tool to understand the magnetic properties. And this is examples of spectra uh, obtained on, on this type of nanometric, nanometer thick layers. OK. Uh, then if we now not only want to measure the uniform spin wave, k equal to 0, but try to draw the dispersion relation, so measure at finite k, the popular system is uh, brillouin light scattering, so an optical technique. And uh, it works this way. So you have a substrate and here a magnetic film in yellow. Okay. And what you can do is you shine your magnetic film with photons, okay, and you look at the photons that are backscattered. Okay, and, and the idea is that because of the interaction with the, between the electromagnetic wave and the spin wave within the magnetic materials, by, this, by looking at this, you can either create a spin wave uh, during the photon scattering event or annihilate a spin wave during the, the photon scattering event. So by just looking at momentum conservation in this type of experiment, you have access to the moment of the spin wave that you've been generating or annihilating. And by looking at the frequency shift between the incoming photon and the reflecting photon, you have uh, information about the, the frequency of the spin wave that you've been excited. So this is very similar to Raman spectroscopy. 
except that this is done now uh, for, uh, for, op for wave vectors of spin waves that are typically at the diffraction limit of an optical spot. Okay, so a few uh, uh, 10 to 20 radians per micron. Okay, and the frequency shift of the photons are typically a few gigahertz to, to a few 10 gigahertz. Okay, so there's the stoke process to, to generate spin waves and the reverse process, which is called anti-stoke, which corresponds to annihilation of the spin wave. Uh, unfortunately, because it's an optical technique, uh, even if you do the experiment in grazing incidence uh, geometry in order to transfer a maximum of wave vector, the maximum wave vector that you're going to transfer from the photons to the spin wave system is going to be given uh, by, uh, by, uh, by the wavelengths of the photons that you're using. So it's not going to be more than, than typically 20 radians per, per micron square. So it's really limited to spin wave wavelengths uh, above uh, 100 and 150 nanometers. Okay. Uh, then there's other methods to measure spin wave that are much more sensitive but that require more elaborate devices. And for instance, if we want to measure spin wave in devices, okay, we will typically use magnetotransport measurement. So we will typically use, for instance, magnetoresistance, okay, that is to say an effect that link the magnetization orientation to the electrical resistance of the device so that we can spectrally resolve the resistance of the device in order to try to spectrally resolve its magnetic excitations. Okay, so this is typically done in uh, in uh, in standard in, in memory elements, okay, which are typically circles of the order with diameter between 20 and 100 nanometer. And imagine you have a device with the magnetization blue pointing towards you. Okay, okay uh, then you have a number of spin waves that can be possible in this geometry. Of course, now it's not plane waves because we are in a confined geometry. So because of the geometry, you're going to have radial spin waves, azimuthal spin waves, and combinations of both. And the frequency of these spin waves is depending on the magnetic properties. So applied field, anisotropy energies, demagnetizing, dipole-dipole contributions, and exchange. So this study, uh, these spin waves have been used essentially so far also as a metrology tool to find these properties at device level. Okay. Uh, in practice, what we do is, is so we pattern, uh, we pattern the film and the magnetoresistive stack uh, okay, at, at deep submicron level. Okay. And uh, instead of using an RF field and measuring the permeability of the device in an inductive manner, like I was doing in VNA FMR, uh, we do it electrically. That is to say, the torque that we use to excite the magnetization is what is called the spin transfer torque. Spin transfer torque is essentially the fact that if you have two magnetic layers, a thin one and a big reservoir, uh, if you flow a lot of current, the electrons, the spins from the reservoir will go to the, to the magnetic layer that is thin, okay, and transfer angular momentum there, and this applies a torque on the magnetization and, and, and manipulates it. Okay, so this is a very efficient process. So we can excite the magnetization by applying an RF current through the device, okay, and if the RF current excites the magnetization, so generates a spin wave, then because of magnetoresistance, the resistance will vary at the same frequency as the as the, as the magnetization. So we send RF in, the resistance varies at the same RF frequency, there's a rectified voltage out. If the field and the applied frequency match with the existence of a spin wave at this, at this specific frequency. Okay. And for instance, uh, uh, we can make susceptibility maps Okay, that are like that. So this is done for a, quite a big device, so 300 uh, nanometer of diameter. And here we are varying the field that is applied to this memory cell and, and varying the frequency of the stimulus. And what you can see is that there's a bunch of spin waves that can be measured either in the layer that is magnetized parallel to the field, that's why they have positive slope, or the layer that is magnetized opposite to the field, so negative slope. And in fact, this corresponds to spin waves that are confined inside the magnetic layer of these devices. 
So if I summarize, there's several ways of measuring spin waves. Okay, ferromagnetic resonance, very sensitive, but only measures at k equal to zero. Okay, Brillouin light scattering, which is an optical technique. So it's restricted to samples that are near the free surface of, of the... So you cannot characterize devices that are buried under a thick cap layer. And magnetotransport measurements that requires that you have an electrical device with the proper electrical bandwidth and some magnetoresistance effect. Okay, so that's the way we, we measure... We were measuring spin waves some time ago. Okay. Uh, but now that we want to use uh, spin wave as information carriers, we needed to develop new experimental techniques. And so this is the subject of the second part of my talk, which is about uh, measuring spin waves in measuring propagating spin waves. So generating spin waves somewhere and measuring them somewhere else and trying, trying to play with that. Okay. So typically the samples will look like that now. You're going to have a ferromagnetic stripe what we call a spin wave bus, okay, of some magnetic material, so for instance permalloy here, okay, and then there's an insulator on top, and on top of the insulator we are going to have antennas in which we flow RF current, so if we flow RF current in this antenna, we generate RF field, excite the spin wave here, it propagates to the right and to the left, and the one that propagates to the right generates an alternative flux on the, on the second antenna, so we can collect the antenna at this place. So excite, propagate, and then, and then measure. So this, this was a close view of the central part of the device. Uh, in practice, uh, this is connected to big pads far away and measured in probe stations uh, that are specific in the sense that we can, uh, we can apply strong fields with various orientations, and this is typically measured with the, with the VNA. Okay, uh, let's now look at some typical spin wave signals. Okay, so uh, what we do, okay, so this is the spin wave signal that is collected after some propagation distance, short, medium, or long, depending on the frequency. And so what happens is that if we are at low frequency, there's no spin waves in the magnetic system, okay? We are in the gap of the spin wave dispersion relation, so there's nothing to be seen. And then we, in a given band of frequency that can be very wide, huh? it's about 10 gigahertz wide, okay? we can have signatures of propagating spin waves. And so I will spend some time now trying to uh, make you understand why we have this sort of signals when we do propagating spin wave spectroscopy. So signal that are finite in a given envelope Okay, and with a phase that rotate with the frequency. So this can be done at a given field. Okay, this is done at a given field. And of course, we can vary the magnetic field in order to push the frequency of the spin waves either up or down. And so uh, uh, what you see, for instance, here, if we look at this same signal, but you look from port 2 to port 1 or from port 1 to port 2 you see that there's a factor of two in, uh, 5 in terms of amplitude and this is a signature of the non reciprocity that I was discussing uh, about before. Okay. Or equivalently if you use the same k vector but you reverse the orientation of the magnetic field from positive to negative you also see immediately that the device transmits much less because of this non reciprocity. Okay, so let me now spend some time explaining you why we have this type of, of signals. So generally, if we take a ferromagnetic body uh, with good magnetic properties and we look at the frequency variation of the susceptibility, it's going to look like that. So it's going to have a real part, okay, with positive and negative peak uh, and an imaginary part that is negative but okay, because it's loss but it's conventionally it's plotted positively, that is peaked at some frequency where the phase rotates a lot. Okay. So this is just what is called ferromagnetic resonance. Okay. And so uh, if we excite a spin wave in the, in the ferromagnetic material, in fact we're going to have a reflection coefficient that will depend on the susceptibility of the magnetic material at, the, at a given frequency and at a given k vector. Okay. And it's also going to depend on the characteristic of the antenna. 
okay, which is essentially the Fourier spectrum of the inductive field of the antenna. Okay, so if, for instance, you have an antenna that is U-shaped, okay, so you flow current this way, if you're below the right arm, the in-plane field is negative, if you're below the left arm, the in-plane field is positive, okay, and if you're in between the two arms, there's an out-of-plane field, and if you're out of the two arms, there's a, an out-of-plane field that is of opposite sign. I mean, this is just bio et sava, no, nothing very special. And if you look at that in frequency space, this is going to be, be picked about some k-vector that is essentially the inverse of the typical size uh, of the antenna. So if you go uh, in, a, in a 100 nanometer regime, this is going to be in the range of, of 10, 10 per micron. Okay. So uh, it's important because in the response function the ref so of the antenna, you not only have the susceptibility, but also this excitation spectrum of the antenna, such that if the antenna is very wide, 100 micron, uh, then essentially this is going to be a Dirac function near k equal to zero. So this is the VNA fMR case that I was talking as the first method. But if we reduce the dimension of the antenna, okay, uh, from uh, 100 micron to 100 nanometer, then uh, the excitation spectrum will spread in k, okay, so that we will spread the response of the magnetic field to higher k. And so it's going to be uh, a, bon, uh, a larger and larger frequency range as we reduce uh, the dimensions of the antenna. Okay. Uh, okay. So this was for the reflection coefficient. Okay. But now, uh, so for the energy that is absorbed by the magnetic film when we are below the antenna. If we now look at the transmission signal, then in addition to exciting the magnetic sample, okay, with a given susceptibility, then the spin wave will travel some distance, say r, okay, and while it travels, since it has the given k vector, its face is going to rotate. So the transmission coefficient has an additional phase, uh, phase, phase propagation factor, okay, such that if the reflection coefficient was like that, with no distance, if we look at some distance, we're going to separate the carriers Okay, and face rotate uh, the, the, the spin waves when we increase the k-vector, which is because of the dispersion relation when we increase the frequency. Okay. And so this phase rotation is indicative just of the propagation distance and of the group velocity. Okay, and this is for one micron, for two, for five, and finally for very large distances. Okay, and uh, I'm just mentioning that if the propagation is too large, uh, we have other complicated frequency responses. Okay, but phase analysis of the propagating spin wave is a way to demodulate the contribution of the different wave vectors. So that's the way we can make spectroscopy. We phase resolve at the output, and each phase corresponds to a given k vector that was generated at the input. Okay. Uh, so let's see, for instance, what happens when we vary the magnetic properties. So that, as I told you, the width of the ferromagnetic resonance is given by this damping factor, which describes the rate at which the energy is leaking from the magnetic degrees of freedom to the other degrees of freedom. Okay. Uh, then what happens is that when the magnetic properties degrade and we increase this coupling between the magnetic degrees of freedom and the other degrees of freedom, we in increase the viscosity, let's say, then we gradually lose the oscillatory character because there's too much loss upon propagation. Somehow the imaginary part of the wave vector becomes larger than the real part of the wave vector. <coughs> so uh, we, we can model that in different limits, and what I want to say is that this is indeed the case experimentally. Okay, so for instance, this these are predictions for low magnetic damping and for large magnetic damping, everything else staying the same. And if indeed uh, we take cobalt nickel multilayers, so that's a typical magnetic sample of interest, and we uh, vary the deposition properties in order to vary the damping parameter, when it's good, we have this oscillatory character uh, in, the, in the spectroscopy of the spin wave while where the magnetic the properties have been degraded intentionally okay then we completely lose this oscillatory character 
Okay, so I just hope now uh, this type of, of shape of the spin wave signals when we vary the frequency is understood. Okay. And, uh, but unfortunately, when we make an experiment that is fully inductive, so exciting with an an one antenna and collecting with another, even if we would remove the magnetic sample, there would be coupling between the two antenna. Okay. So the spin wave signal that I showed is not the only thing that is seen if you connect a VNA to one input and one output antenna. You also see direct inductive coupling. Okay. And especially the direct inductive coupling that passes through the permeability of the magnetic device. That's why uh, when we propagate over a very long propagation distance, the, the signal from the propagating spin wave attenuates expo exponentially, while all the contributions that are just inductive or capacitive coupling, they decrease in a polynomial manner. Okay, just because the magnetic field decreases in a polynomial manner with the distance. So if we try to collect spin waves very far away from the input antenna, in fact what we collect is a, a sum of a spin wave contribution that has this oscillatory character and a distant inductive coupling that does not involve propagating spin waves. Okay. So, so far for the, for the signal theory, and now we will uh, use uh, this tool to choose among the very many possibilities of spin waves that we can manipulate. I mentioned at the beginning that they are very anisotropic, so there's a zoology of spin waves, okay, magnetostatic surface waves, uh, backward volume waves, okay, and magnetostatic forward wave. And we've studied all of them in order to determine which waves, which spin waves would be the best to transport information. So everything I showed so far was in the Damon Eshbar uh, geometry where the K vector of the spin wave is horizontal, okay, and it's uh, while the magnetization was perpendicular to the spin wave conduit. Okay. Uh, this, in terms of application, this would not be the most interesting because in order to have the magnetization align along the short axis of a stripe, you need to apply a strong field. Okay. Because the magnetization uh, wants to be in the orientation that is favored by the shape and isotropy that is along, along the field. So in, a, in this, this situation of Damon Eshbar waves, you can only deal with straight spin wave conduits. Uh, in contrast, if we use the other configuration where the, the magnetization is along the conduit, okay, and the, the wave vector propagation is also along this conduit, in fact, you can in principle work with bended conduits, have some angles, and have a more, more interesting designs. Okay. So in terms of application, it could seem more interesting to work in the backward volume configuration, and that's why uh, Umesh Pascal, my postdoc who is here, okay, has been uh, trying to compare uh, in a metrological manner the advantages, the pros and cons between these two configurations. Okay. Uh, in fact, the bad thing about this configuration uh, is that is is the group velocity. Okay. If you send a spin wave, okay, it's gonna exist for a few nanoseconds. That's the lifetime of typical spin waves. So if the velocity is large, during this lifetime, the spin wave is going to propagate a long distance. Okay, but if, so you will be able to efficiently collect it somewhere else. Uh, but if the group velocity is small, it, doesn't, it attenuates very fast in space. And in fact, the main difference between this configuration, Damon Eshbar waves and backward volume waves, lies in the group velocity, which are typically 10 kilometers per second, in the first case, and typically less than half a kilometer per second in the second case. So there's a factor of 20 in terms of group velocity, and so as a result, the attenuation lengths, so the lengths over which you can measure spin waves with decent amplitude, uh, changes by a factor of 20. Okay. And in addition, if you see what happens, you see that the group velocity is at low field compared to at high field, the lower the field, the smaller the group velocity. Okay. And of course, for applications, since generating field costs a lot of energy, it's much better to have devices working at low field. 
but the lower the field the less is the group velocity so the less the spin wave propagates if we are in this geometry okay while it doesn't change that much uh, for for the other configuration so if we compare the maps of the of the spin wave signals measured after propagation in the damonesh bar waves so that's what, what i was showing before for a, for a given field at low frequencies there's nothing then there's this oscillatory signal uh, within a given frequency band if you take the same sample but you just rotate the magnetization by 90 degrees you obtain this map okay where you see that the group velocity is much smaller that's the first point you see also that the signal is much smaller there's an order of magnitude okay and you see that at, at, at low fields okay and low frequencies essentially you measure almost no signal okay because the group velocity tends to zero and this is really something that makes unfortunately these spin waves not really usable for, for applications because they do not propagate over long over distances that are long enough okay uh, so so far I only talked about spin waves that propagate in a conduit with a wave vector that is in the length of the conduit but in fact uh, okay since spin waves can have k vectors in any direction the situation is more complex and so we'll now see what we can do for the spectroscopy of the transverse component of the spin waves okay uh, so if we look at raw data signals so these are the bulk lines and we compare with the signal that we would compute assuming that the wave is a 1d plane wave uh, these are the bold lines you see that the plane waves describe most of the physics okay it seems very satisfactory except at low frequencies where you systematically see this additional ripple okay in the experimental data and that is not observed uh, or not 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 in the model and this comes from the our assumption that we propagate a 1d planar wave okay uh, indeed if we do the full calculation so using micromagnetics we calculate magnetization dynamics in a numerical way uh, so we have the antenna that is here it's a calculation by my colleagues uh, in IMEC Belgium for in Chubo Taro there's a misprint sorry okay uh, if you look at the the wave that propagates you see that in fact it's not just a plane wave there's an additional modulation that gives this sort of diamond features that repeats itself in space okay and this illustrates the fact that there are waves which have components also in the transverse direction and this is something that I want to model now just to see if this is something that we can harness or or if it's just a disadvantage okay. and so for this uh, Umesh has developed uh, has adapted the time gating techniques that is common to to your community to to spin to the spin wave domain okay and so let's you here we look at the raw data and as i told you there's an additional modulation at low frequency both in the real part and the imaginary part of the transmitted signal okay so uh, what it did is calculate uh, the pulse response uh, so in the in the time domain and indeed what we can see is there is the direct electromagnetic coupling at almost zero delay and then the spin waves are arriving one to two nanoseconds after and if you s have a close look at that you see that there's a second packet of spin waves arriving here and maybe a third there okay so uh, what i do what i will do to illustrate this point is i know that the d the spin waves decay expo exponentially with time so i will multiply this data by an exponential factor with the time in order to compensate for the loss okay so this is the same data but just multiply by exponential t of a tau where tau is something like two nanoseconds okay and here you directly see that there's fast spin waves arriving okay then there are slower waves and then there's maybe very slow waves arriving okay. and so if we time gate these different waves okay we see that if i Fourier transform back this first packet i find the the green response that is exactly the same as the one that is modeled assuming a uniform plane wave uh, with no transverse wave vector okay uh, if i take the second wave packet 
I find uh, this ripple contribution at low frequency, and the third wave packet is not so easy to identify. And in fact, uh, we believe that this is, this is due to the fact uh, that because we are working in a stripe geometry where the stripe width is of the order of, of, the, of a micron, okay, the spin waves are quantized also in the width of the stripe, and you can have modes uh, that will either be the most uniform mode with just one, uh, just two nodes at the end, or non-uniform modes which have additional nodes. So there will be also an, an n-equal two mode. Okay, but we are inductively not sensitive to uh, to even modes. Okay, so uh, as you can see, if we increase uh, the transverse wave vector component, okay, this will generate uh, confined spin, co spin waves that are confined within the widths. Okay, and since you remember that graph uh, about the, let's say, the zoology of spin wave depending on the orientation between the wave vector and the magnetization, you see that, for instance, this wave has essentially a longitudinal wave vector, but it's also a standing wave in the opposite direction. And if we go to, to the higher order modes, uh, for the same longitudinal wave vector, the transverse wave vector increases. That is to say that for these waves, we will gradually pass from a dispersion that is like that to a dispersion that goes like that, okay? When we increase the contribution of the transverse wave vector compared to the longitudinal wave vector. So you, you immediately see that what happens is that these different modes going continuously from here to there will have different group velocities, and that's the reason why these waves arrive first at the output, while the others arrive later. Okay, so using this all-electrical inductive uh, spin wave propagation spectroscopy, not only we can reconstruct the dispersion relations in the direction of propagation, but somehow we can do it for the different confined spin waves. Okay, and this ends uh, my part about the development of propagating spin wave spectroscopy. And we'll now uh, use uh, this, uh, this know-how in order to make spin wave interferometry experiments and logic gates for wave computing. So the instrument, uh, the things we wanted to develop together with uh, uh, my partners at IMEC Belgium is a majority gate. That is to say, a system where you would have three inputs and the output would be the majority of the input. Okay. And so this is, in wave computing, this is done this way. You have three inputs, okay, uh, that each of them generate waves, and you look at the interference at the output. So either you emit three waves that are in phase, and uh, at the output they are in phase, so this is called the strong majority case, or if one of them is out of phase, this is called the weak majority uh, case. The, f the, s the phase at the output is still uh, zero if the majority was zero, but the amplitude is, is less from three here to one, okay. And you also have the reverse cases, minus weak majority and minus strong majority, okay. For this to work in a wave computing experiment, you need to have the propagation distance between two ports that matches exactly with the spin wave wavelengths. So that if you send a wave with a phase zero here, at the output, it has the same phase zero plus a number of two pi's, okay, but, but zero. So, so in this type of experiment, what we will do is we'll have a ferromagnetic stripe, a cobalt iron boron, 30 nanometer, on which we will have a few antennas, okay? And uh, so four antennas, and three of them will be used as inputs, and the last one is going to be used as output, okay? And uh, if we look uh, at the device from far away, uh, okay, uh, these, I mean, the, the antennas are connected to coplanar stripes uh, for me to have an easy connection and easy calibration uh, to, to the devices itself. Okay. Uh, it, it's not evident that it will work because, as I mentioned, with an inductive antenna, we're not exciting just one spin wave. Okay we're exciting many spin waves at the same time. Okay. Remember this graph of the micromagnetic simulation? We see that essentially there's a 1D wave propagating to the right 
okay but there's also non-uniform waves within the within the width of the stripe and also some more complicated patterns with spin waves emitted from the edge towards the center okay. so uh, if we do the micromagnetic prediction uh, of the result and this is once again a calculation by microlic flow in Chubotao if we use two antenna uh, uh, if they emit in phase then indeed we have the same type of patterns with the strength and amplitude and if they emit out of phase, okay, there's going to be destructive interference, but for the most uniform spin wave, not for the higher order spin waves. Huh? So as you can see, this diamond feature is still preserved. And if we do it for three antenna, uh, then we expect, okay, constructive interference if the three antenna share the same phase. Okay, partly constructive if they share, if two of them share the same faces. And you see it's not evident that it will work because there's a lot of non-uniformities in the magnetization pattern because we're not able to generate just one spin wave. Okay, so, so the experiment is first, uh, we choose the last uh, antenna as the output antenna and I calibrate my system so that I compensate for the loss between antenna 1 and antenna 4 2 and 4, 3 and 4 okay so we adjust the amplitude and the phases uh, so, so that each phase arrives at the out uh, each spin wave arrives at the output with zero phase okay this is done here for the three different configurations and then if we invert the phases at the input we indeed invert the collected results and so now that we are able to generate waves on each of these three of the three input ports, we can construct the true stable. Okay. So if it's a majority gate, there are eight cases, two to the power of three. Okay. So if the three inputs are in phase, then the result. So we choose a given frequency, which is the frequency at which the spin wave wavelength matches exactly with the interport distance, two microns something in this case. Okay. So if the three inputs share the same phase, then we have an amplitude of three with a strong majority. If the three spin waves uh, have opposite phase, we have an amplitude of minus three. So it's again strong majority at the output. Okay. And in any other situations, there are weak majority that replicates the majority phase of the input. So also plus one amplitude or minus one amplitude. So this is just... I mean, this is nothing special, like wave interferometry, people in photonics have done that for quite a lot of time, okay, but for spin waves, uh, this is an achievement because manipulating spin waves at this frequency than this wavelength is not, is not that easy, okay. So this is the first demonstration of submicron spin wave majority gate, okay. Uh, another thing that is interesting is that if you look at the design of the sample, uh, we decided to choose this antenna as the output, but in fact we can choose one of the inner antenna. Okay. So if I optimize the true stable for this configuration and then I just swap the roles of the antenna, we can still construct uh, the true stable with strong majority or weak majority. Of course, uh, then there is some, pre some spread in the results of the, of the weak majority and this spread is due to the fact that since spin waves are non-reciprocal in fact in this geometry which is Damon H bar geometry they are slightly non-reciprocal so you cannot just simply swap the role of the antenna and hope that everything will be as perfect okay but still it, it's, it's working fine so you have a majority gate with where the role of inputs and output is very flexible okay a uh, second thing that we wanted to demonstrate is that it indeed works in the submicron regime. Okay, so uh, so we did it for a spin wave conduit uh, that is sub submicron in width, and we also did it for a spin wave conduit that is uh, large, but where but using spin waves that have submicron wavelengths. Okay. And in both cases, we could construct majority. We could construct the majority gate uh, true stables. And uh, the last thing that is funny about spin waves is that, in fact, since you can vary the k-vector 
without changing the frequency. You can multiply the k vector by two without multiplying the frequency by two. So the dispersions are not linear. Okay, it's not like acoustical wave of, of photons. Okay, uh, so you can the, you can harness this and have a majority gate that is able to sustain frequency multiplexing. Let let me explain this. So far, we've we've been using port positions that were at at the distance that was exactly the spin wave wavelengths. Okay. But if we skip the same physical system, so the same distance between antenna, but we increase the, the frequency, this will increase the k-vector, and now instead of matching one wavelength between two ports, we can match two wavelengths, three wavelengths, four wavelengths, okay. and, uh, and if we match a finite number of wavelengths between the antenna, if we send phase zero at the input, at the output, we still have phase zero. There is phase replication. So the majority gate will work at all the frequencies for which the wave vector matches with the interport distance. Okay. So, so far, uh, this is a model, and the experiment will come after. So far, I showed the result in the range of 30 gigahertz. So this was the true stable for the the let's say the resonant condition okay and for the same geometrical parameter and, and applied field we expect to observe the majority gate also at a higher frequency uh, with a smaller wavelength so this should be a lambda <laughs> okay uh, a wavelength that is half of it okay uh, but we can do more okay because in fact uh, you can also work with half wavelengths. So imagine now that the spin wave has a half wavelength that matches with the interport distance. Then if the phase is zero at the input, it's going to transform into pi at the output. And that is to say in terms of logic that we factorized a NOT gate at the input of port 1. Okay, and also of port 2. So if we manage to have half a wavelength within the interport distance. Now we are going to have a majority gate that makes the majority of not P1, P2, and not P3, where P1, P2, P3 are the three inputs. And this works the same way if you fit 1.5 wavelengths uh, within the interport distance. Okay, so this was the calculation for the majority gate. Okay, and if we, if we show the full frequency band, you see that there will be additional frequencies where you have a clear logic gate, and this is a clear strong majority, a clear weak minority, weak minority and weak majority. Okay. Okay. But you see that the colors which reflect the true stable are not the same. So this is not the same logic function because there are not gates that are factorized. And this is also this should also working at work at lower frequency. If we indeed do the experiment, okay, so, so this is still the model, and, and this is the experiment. Okay, you still see that indeed you can have the majority gate uh, for uh, an interpot distance that is equal to the spin wave wavelengths. You can have the second order majority gate here at about uh, 15 gigahertz. You can have the majority gate that is factorized with not gates at the input, and the last one should be here, okay? And the last one doesn't work, because as you can see, there is this small ripple, okay, that was identified as coming from the fact that we excite non-uniform spin waves that play an essential role in this, in this range of frequency. And so this is a demonstration of frequency multiplexing uh, in a spin wave majority gate. And so this, end my, this ends my talk, and so I hope I've convinced you that spin waves are interesting with waves, not only because their physics is rich, but they are very specific, in terms, very anisotropic, positive and negative group velocities. Okay. Uh, they can be very non-reciprocal. Okay. Um, okay. Then they can be measured either electrically or inductively, or using magnetotransport methods in a very efficient manner. Okay. And then now the, the understanding is sufficient that we can 
understand the properties of propagating spin waves, okay, and harness them uh, to to make uh, to make logic gates, just like the one I've been showing, which is the majority gate. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.